Hello, people of the internet. My name is Danielle Terciano, and I am here to welcome you to the very first episode of Made Possible by Pop Culture, the podcast. Now, before I introduce you to my very first guest, because yes, every episode is going to have a special guest. I'm not just going to talk at you for 45 minutes to an hour. I do want to tell you a little bit about what this is and what I'm trying to do on this podcast. So here I'm going to invite guests every week or every episode rather to share how specific moments in pop culture history shaped them as children growing up. But I also want to delve into what is influencing them today or maybe even inspiring them to do something professionally and or creatively. So as someone who spent the majority of my career, the better part of two decades writing about primarily television, yeah, I have to admit, the majority of the pop culture discussed on this podcast will be moments and characters from television history, but I'm not going to discriminate and I'm not going to tell guests what they can and cannot talk about. It is totally up to them to share what they want to. Now, having said that, I may have lost a few of you and I'm sorry about that if I, I did, but also I'm glad to have those of you who are still listening because you're the ones that are really into this type of discussion. And for those of you still with me, I want you to please join me in welcoming the very first guest ever on my Made Possible by Pop Culture, the podcast, Marissa Rothman. Now, Marissa is the owner, writer, editor, social media manager, everything, forgive me, my remote.com, but she's also worked for TV Guide Magazine. She's also worked for Netflix's To Doom or To Dumb or however we say it. Uh, she's freelanced for The Hollywood Reporter. Full disclosure, she freelanced for me when I was at Variety. And there is a reason I chose her to be my very first guest. And thankfully she agreed because we used to host a vodcast together called We Have Thoughts. And I just felt like what better thing to do than to throw back to that and have her come on and share our thoughts or really her thoughts about, about pop culture. So welcome, Marissa, and thank you for coming. Um, how are things in your world today? I am, hey, look, that is the nicest intro I've gotten in a very long time. <laughs> I'm very excited to talk about your stuff with you because we still have too many thoughts. We have a tendency of like saying we're gonna be done with our conversation and then talking for three hours after that. So good luck to us both. Well, I was going to say that we're not going to talk for three hours today, mostly because I don't think for the first episode, anybody would stay with us. So um, just, I do think we should just jump right in. I mean, the first thing I am asking all of my guests to do is to talk about something from your childhood or your past in pop culture that, that inspired you, that influenced you, that shaped who you are as a person, as a career woman, whatever that may be. Um, why don't you go ahead and set the scene for what you chose and why you chose it? Uh, so I have always been a nerdy child. I know this is, I'm sure, a shock to literally anyone who's ever met me or encountered me for more than five seconds. Um, and one of my earliest pop culture loves was soap operas. And I think a lot of people who love soaps were introduced by family members. I was in the same way. Um, One Life to Live was my soap. It, and I've watched a bunch of others in the years since, but like One Life to Live was my gateway into that genre. Um, And I fell in love with the world. And it, it's not just, you know, the romance and the epic storytelling. It's just, it was families being families. It was representation that I did not see in primetime TV, really. Like, I grew up a biracial Jewish child. My biracial rep was minimal. Mm. Jewish rep was minimal. Like, I had Rugrats and technically the Gellers on Friends, but, like, not really because they celebrated Christmas. And so on One Life to Live, I had Nora, who was Jewish, and she had a biracial daughter, and it's something that I could be like, oh, it's not the same, but I see elements of myself in this show, in this world. And it, it you know, soaps, it sounds silly. They're addicting. They're, they have a sense of storytelling because you have five episodes a week. Right. I don't think, I was gonna say, I don't think it sounds silly, but go ahead. But it's, I mean, I know you are someone who also is, is from that soap world, so you get this. But it's something where you're spending if you choose five hours a week with these characters, with these worlds, and it's it's asking you to invest a lot, but it's also 
rewarding you at times in ways you get to have relationships with these characters mm -hmm. that can span years and decades in a way that you don't get on primetime TV for the most part. Um, and so I was enamored with the soap world. At some point, I started picking up those magazines at the supermarket because when you're a kid at the supermarkets, if you're not looking at all the candy and stuff, you're with your parents who is, you know, putting in the thing that when they're trying to put the groceries on the conveyor belt to actually pay, you're left with the magazine rack. Yeah. And so for me, after Disney Adventures, I found the soap opera magazines and started reading those at the checkout line and became obsessed with that and what that kind of journalism was. Okay, so and wait, this is multifold. So I wanna I wanna go back a minute because as you mentioned, soap operas are not only multiple episodes a week, but also, I mean, th these are shows that span decades. When did you first start watching One Life Tilt? Because I'm just going to say this for the audience listening and not seeing us. We were not born when the show started. One Life to Live started in 1968. So already you were coming in kind of late, but I am. I just want to talk about when you came in. I came in, it had to have been the early, to, like my first TV memories are of that soap. So it would have been the early to mid 90s. I can't tell you exactly what year, but it would have been certainly in the early to mid 90s. And like that was the era that I I started and I watched all the way till the end of the run. Okay. So, I mean, that is still, you know, that okay. time frame still says a lot. I think also that time frame says a lot about what you were just talking about regarding the magazines because mid 90s, I think, was the heyday for the magazines in the sense of you had Soap Opera Digest, you had Soap Opera Magazine, you had Soap Opera Weekly, you had Soaps in Depth, you had like whatever that special offshoot was that would dedicate one issue to NBC Soaps, one issue to ABC Soaps, one issue to CBS, like et cetera, et cetera. It sounds maybe crazy to people today who don't there are not that many soaps that exist anymore, but also there are not that many magazines that exist anymore, let alone so many for such a niche piece of entertainment. So what, A, what was your magazine of choice if there was one? So let's start there. Uh, I would read whatever I could literally get my hands on at the magazine store. But when I actually started purchasing them or got subscriptions, it was Soaps in Depth, uh, I mean, excuse me, Soap Opera Digest and ABC Soaps in Depth. Because I, again, ABC girl. Mm -hmm. So again, you're probably not entirely shocked by this. I still have, not all, but I still have a bunch of those old magazines. I thought you might. I was kind of hoping they were going to be your backdrop for this, but that's okay. I almost brought them out, but I was like, this is going to be noisy. It's going to be <laughs> with my luck because I'm just like, that's not going to go well. I can post photos on social media after when to, when this goes out, we'll post some accompanying nice. photos because I have still a deep soap collection I've got like trading cards I have uh buttons from Super Soap Weekend I have like I'm a nerd like I'm I not didn't cool. know there I were have... trading cards I will say I was an NBC specifically yeah. Days of Our Lives soap opera person and I did do their fan weekends which were different from the ABC ones but I don't believe we had trading cards I maybe I'm wrong this is specifically all my children trading cards mm. and I like I Again, nothing about this is going to be a surprise. I went through a significant trading card phase because also if you, I am also a sports nerd and a baseball fan, uh, but like I collected X-Files cards and fringe cards and lost cards. And I found a box of all my children cards that were like super, mm. super priced. And it's like, that's very early nineties, which from an era that I did not watch live, but I'm familiar with. Um, and so, yeah, I have a lot of soup stuff. It is a... Yeah, I've got a lot of stuff. <laughs> but yeah, okay, it, it so was best and and ABC Steps Depth were my two big, big ones. What I mean, and what was it when you were picking up these magazines? Was it just a way to kind of get more insight into the show you already loved? Like, what was it about the magazine experience that made the soap experience for you more special? I mean, it was a combination of things. Like, I remember they used to have a thing where they would, like, tease what was coming ahead, like, in what is basically, like, a log line of, like, coming up. And I, every week, I would read them. Like, every Friday, I'd be like, okay, this is exciting. And then I'd be like, now I have to wait another whole week to find out what's going to happen after that. Like, it felt like such a rush in a way that is bizarre in some ways, because I, I would still watch it. Even if mm -hmm. it was something that I hated on there, I would still watch what was coming. Um... But I, I, you know, I loved reading 
you know, the features. I love getting, seeing the opinions. Like there was an opinion columnist that had an entire thing. Someone's like, I agree, someone I didn't. Um, <laughs> Did you ever write in? Did you ever like letter to the editor or anything like that? Like, which all, honestly, I'm shocked. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I did. I wrote and I got mine in print a couple of times. What? Like little, little blurbs. Like, I think this person should have more screen time. This person deserves an Emmy nominee, like whatever. No, I didn't. And I, and honestly, in hindsight, it is deeply shocking that I did not. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it was also fascinating because I started with One Life to Live, mm -hmm. but then started watching the other ABC soaps when I was, you know, middle school. But there was a period of time in, you know, the late 90s, late, late 90s, early to mid 2000s, where I was reading everything in the magazine. So I was knowing what was going on in every single soap, even if wow. I wasn't watching, because I was just intrigued by it. Like there's, I've never, I don't know if I've actually ever seen a full episode of Bold and the Beautiful, okay. but I know so much about what happened with Brooke and about <laughs> Angle with her daughter and her daughter's husband. Like I know all of these things still 20 plus years later because I read about it extensively. Right. Those magazines, because I was following those stories. Like I couldn't devote five hours or, you know, yeah. two and a half a week to those shows, but I was still reading what was happening. So I yeah. was still finding out what was just happening. And so it felt, it was a way to feel connected to the soap world in a Wait. way that was, no, I was just going to ask, because you 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 mentioned, you know, you're into One Life to Live in a lot of ways with Nora because of representation, which is so important. But now you're talking about reading even the, uh, the stories about the shows you didn't watch. So how, I mean, I guess what I'm wondering too is how much of what you were reading, were you seeking, were you trying to seek out specifically things about Nora, about One Life to Live to find out more? And it led you to care more about the world at large and the way that it was written about and covered at large or was it kind of was it a chicken and egg situation i mean it is my my deep love of one life to live as a whole definitely led me to read more about the world and it's and i will say for instance with dates of our lives i started watching days because of things that i was reading in the magazine oh, i started watching okay. super the when, wait cover. wait when did you start watching because i'm curious if we overlapped and just have never talked about this i think i feel like we have the super the the serial killer arc where Mar marlena went crazy and then the mellow oh, swan yes. So like, that's when I started like watching for a number of years. It was a whole thing. <laughs> um, but also it was, yeah, so I, I definitely was reading specifically for One Life to Live. And then because One Life to Live was one of very few soaps, I mean, excuse me, one of many soaps at the time, because at that time there was like nine, 10 soaps on the air. So it was like, well, what else is in the magazine? Who else are, and with soaps, the actors would frequently leave and go to a different mm -hmm. show. So like, well, I don't watch the show, but I love this actor from this thing. So like I would read, that would be a gateway in as well. So it was definitely kind of a little bit of chicken and egg, but my love of One Life to Live as a whole definitely made me seek out more and more and more. Sure. And I mean, I feel like a lot of, us who have gone on to be entertainment journalism journalists, we've had this love of entertainment, but I don't know that a lot of us thought it could be a job when we were kids, but it maybe feels like you knew it could be a job younger than a lot of us because of the fate, the way you were consuming the, the articles, the media, the magazines. Is that true? Did you like, was, did you look at these magazines and say, oh, I want to do this. I could grow up to do this. Was it at any way a teaching tool? Yes, absolutely. It was. So after a very brief uh, X-Files related detour in my head of like, oh, maybe I'll do something that Dana Scully is doing, which in I hindsight, mean, Marissa, not a bad oh, thing to choose. Well, OK, I, I yeah, yeah, I just also I'm like, wow, 11 and 12 year old Marissa, you were something. Um, but I, you know, I wanted to not to sound like Ariel, but like I wanted to be where the people were. Like I, mm -hmm. The soaps that I wanted to be in that, like, I wanted to know more. I wanted to be able to kind of tell those stories. Yes. That way. Like I was not, I was never a person who wanted to write those stories. Like I was never, I didn't, I know people grow up like wanting to like create their own show or create, like that was not my dream thing as a kid. I wanted to write about it. I wanted to know more. I'm a naturally curious some might say nosy, but like <laughs> I am a naturally curious person and I just desperately wanted to know everything about everything. 
Um, so I knew pretty, pretty early on, like definitely by early teenage that I wanted to be a reporter. And I specifically wanted to be a soap opera reporter. Like I Mm wanted to cover soaps. Um, when I was in high school, my senior project, I created my own soap opera magazine. So I was just going to ask you if you did any sort of mock-up sounds weird, but like any sort of entry point just for fun. Yeah. I, so I created like in our, our, I went to a, uh, an abnormal high school in a was a high school college program. So I was okay. high school both classes. And was and this way, can, was this like you elected to do this as a project or was this somehow tied to something that you were in a class you were already doing? We all had to do a senior project. We had to do something that was tied to something that was our career goals. Oh, wow. And okay. basically we had to come up with like a pitch. This sounds so ridiculous, but like <laughs> it, it was a, uh, elevated school I think is fair to say so like we mm-hmm. had to come up with a pitch and like almost like a thesis of what our project would be what we wanted to get from it etc cetera, etc cetera. and so because I wanted to be a reporter and specializing in soaps the way to kind of do it was to craft a soap opera magazine so I did that wrote articles did an interview which oh, nice. with who who did you do an interview with um, an actor from one life to live oh okay is by chance, the drama instructor at the college portion of my school. And That's so pretty cool. Right. And so I was like, I'm thinking of doing this. I'm like I asked my advisors, I'm like, can I reach out to him and see if he'll be willing to do this interview? My first interview ever, which is insane. Um, but he was lovely. It and he didn't need to do it. I was a high school student. It's like he's a college professor, but at the same time, mm-hmm. it's a high school subsection of this college. It's like it's specialty program, but it's not his responsibility. He was did not need to be as nice as was to a tiny little not tiny, but like completely green, yeah. tiny. Yeah, girl. But, but I mean, they don't want you. They don't want to dissuade you. I think, like, if especially if you're ch- electing to do this as your thesis. I'm using the word thesis, even if it wasn't what you called it. I feel most of these people would say, you know what? I should encourage her. I'm, I've been in this business. I know how hard it is. If I can help you, I will. I say that knowing that when I was in college, I did effectively a thesis documentary on days of our lives, specifically fandom. And I, when I interviewed one actor, I did off camera. He did say to me, I don't think you should go into soaps. He was like, I I like your passion for it. I won't call him out. He was like, I like your passion for it. But he was like, this is, we are a dying industry. And it was true because I did that in 2005. And there were still a greater number of soaps on than there are today. I mean, I don't remember exactly how many were on. And this was about Days of Our Lives. That was on then. It's still on now, thankfully. But a lot, we've lost a lot of them along the way, including One Life to Live. That was still on in 2005. And it's not now. So anyway, um, I'm, I'm really happy that you had a, somebody who supported it and, you know, built, helped you build this. Yeah, it was, it was a very, it was a very, I mean, thank God. Cause I, I mean, my first actual interview experience was unbelievably surreal as well. Like just cause it was in the best way, throwing, you know, me into the deep end of everything. But like, I'm so glad I was able to have a safe space to do my first interview because I'm sure I was terrible. Like, I'm sure I was terrible. I was, I mean, a a minor. Like, I mean, I started doing this as a teenager too, but it's like at the same time, like being able to do that with no stakes. Like if I I messed it up, this was not a situation where my entire story would fall apart. Like, yes, my senior project would have been probably bad, but like it was something where it's not like I had editors and like would have lost my job, et cetera, et cetera. It was it was such a safe place to kind of fuel that creative energy. And and yeah, at that point, even like the silver magazines were kind of dwindling down at that mm. point. Um, there were still- Did you ever try to go work for one? No, I, so I started doing this as a literal teenager. I started doing it as an internship very, very, very early in college. Um, and I, and I also mean, again, this is not a surprise to you because you spent more than five seconds around me. I fiercely love primetime TV too. And it's like, and, you know, X-Files changed the way that I loved that, even though I still wanted to be a sub reporter in a post X-Files world. I could see that the sub magazine world was contracting. Mm-hmm. And I could also see that there was so much interesting stuff to do in terms of primetime TV. It was like, 
it was, there was a lot of stuff there. And so I was very, very lucky that I, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things to say about internships. I'm not going to blindly defend or, or excuse a lot of the mistreatment that goes on in a lot of internships. Sure. But I'm very, very lucky. I was able to intern for basically three years, one of which was basically doing this as a full-time job mm. before I even did it because I got to learn so much, so much in a time when I was also, again, protected and was able to be mentored by people who had been doing this for a while. And so when it came time to actually doing this as a career, hilariously enough, and again, calling back to something we just spoke about, you know, my real only choices in terms of what I was thinking was either this or sports journalism. Okay. A bunch of uh, sports journalism classes in, in college. Um, and one of my professors is, was and is a writer for LA Times. And he's like, I think you could be really good at this. And I was like, I already have a job and I like that job. I mean, that's nice. <laughs> Thank how you. Often can we, especially in today's climate, how often yeah, can we I mean, do that? Yeah. And it, it was funny because, you know, when I, I had zapped to it at the time, when I did start doing that more full time, we were in the same building as LA Times. So I'd occasionally run into them in the, hub, in the lobby and be like, hey, nice to see you again. Still at it. <laughs> good to do this. Good. Um, but yeah, so I didn't really, when it came time you know, between making the project in my senior year of high school and, you know, being in senior in college and actually thinking about it, a lot had changed in the world, in the soap opera world, in the magazine world, in my life. And like, I really found a love of talking about primetime shows in that time as well. And obviously, yeah, it, it's so it never really was a serious thing. And now there really isn't much. I mean, there is still some sub coverage, but it is a very, very different world than it used to be, which is deeply sad. I mean, just the entertainment industry and the magazine industry changing so much is deeply sad. Yes, it is absolutely sad in, I think, how much we've lost. But at the same time, you run your own site. So do you like what are your feelings today about covering soaps when if you have the freedom, if you have the time, which we'll get into in a minute. I'm not saying you have the time. I think people underestimate what goes into saying that we write about television. It's not just I watch an hour of television and I jot my thoughts down while I'm watching and I'm done. So I'm not trying to give you more work. That is, but I but I do have a curiosity about how you juggled. I loved soaps. They made me want to be a reporter. I'm not going to be a soap reporter, but can I still cover soaps as an entertainment reporter, period? So for me, uh, I've covered soaps in some capacities. Um, I, I, you know, the downside is, you know, obviously it's the soap world drastically changed mm -hmm. in the, in the late 2000s, early 2010s um, with the contraction of the soap world, like ABC gutting two thirds of its soaps still is infuriating, still is ridiculous. I mean, I'm sure they think it's financially sane, but like for me, it's still, <laughs> it still hurts. Um, you know, but I was able to do a little bit of coverage. Um, I, you know, weirdly enough, I just, I realized the other day or a couple weeks ago, um, that, because of TCA, I think my very first TCA, When Life to Live, was actually there, which oh, is wow. weird. Um, yeah. Also, it, just for everybody listening, TCA is a television critics association, and they put on basically tours where they do a couple weeks of panels of new and returning shows where the stars and the producers come out and talk about what's happening in this upcoming season. So to hear you say that in knowing that you started in TCA... I don't know exactly the year, what year, like, but definitely in the early aughts, right? It was, it was the, yeah, it was a uh, pre-2010 era. Okay. Yes. Still, that's, I think that's a pretty big ordeal to have a soap show up to something like that because so many of these networks weren't putting that kind of money behind these shows in that time period. And TCA costs money because people have to bring the, the, the cast, bring the producers, hair, makeup they're paying the, maybe I shouldn't give this away, but you know, the networks are paying for the space. They're saying, we're going to do a panel. We're going to feed the journalists that are coming. And and sometimes it's a couple hours. Sometimes it's all day and they do a breakfast, a lunch, a party. It's, it's not a cheap endeavor. Yeah. And so it was, it, I didn't realize at that time how rare it was to have something like that there. I mean, since then there's been a number of, of soap centered TCA panels 
um, most specifically and most recently uh, and most regularly general hospital because they've had a couple sure. of like they've also so, anniversaries yeah so and, and one life to live i believe was for a milestone uh mm-hmm. year as well but it was just something where it was you know it was a way i could cover it i you know i did interviews there um i did the final all my children don't get out here in mm-hmm. la which was you know bittersweet and sad and i okay gonna admit my chutzpah here um and i said to the publicist i'm like hey if you guys are doing anything for new york for one life to live let me know and i'll fly my way out there i, I had oh, something wow. to show cover um and they're like oh that's a good question that's a good point let us get back to you and they got back to me and they're like okay we're actually going to do an entire abc trip so come out to new york for one life to live for the very short-lived pan am remember that show which oh, yeah so- but i mean this is so great that you got to go to the set yeah and so i got to go to one life to live and you know it was it was a very incredible and bittersweet thing because I talked to, you know, almost all of the cast that was there, but out of everyone in our group, two of us watched the show. So when I was doing one of my interviews, I know. (laughs) I also think that's why like, it doesn't make sense to send them to TCA. The majority of the people in that room are not covering daytime, but also you would imagine if you're inviting to people to, to set, you're inviting people that cover daytime. Again, you don't have all of these, what did I list, five magazines from the 1990s, but you definitely have two plus all of the out- online outlets that that cover daytime sometimes, even if they don't get to do it all the time. I mean, it was obvious enough that when I asked one of the actresses a question, she was like, she stopped and went, oh, you actually watch our show. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, not, I mean, I understand it, but like, I would not have flown to New York. Correct. A final then without like it's and it's not in the interview in case anyone wants to go search the page i cut that out of the final interview because that was nice of you i don't know that i would have i would have been like yes let's call out all the people who probably make more money than i do and don't do their barest of research yeah i mean i just it's it's it was heartbreaking that that was the experience they were having as they were also having to deal with saying Mm -hmm. goodbye to them as well but it was an incredible privilege i spoke to you know erica slazak who's Mm -hmm. like in that world and it's like you know, it was, it meant a lot. It was deeply sad, deeply. I mean, I literally still remember where I was when we found out that that was canceled. You actually may have literally been with me because it was at a CW screening. Oh, I won't remember. I, no. I mean, I I mean, I don't uh, remember. One other reporter and I were very upset about it because mm-hmm. um, all my children and one life were canceled in one thing. And I, and you must have been there because it was a billion years ago maybe i just yeah i now i feel bad that i don't remember because it was obviously an emotional important moment for you and as your friend i'm like oh i hope i was appropriately responding to it in the moment but who knows because again i don't remember yesterday i will be blunt if you had been inappropriate i would have remembered that and you i don't remember that okay good and that's neutral <laughs> at worst you were neutral i should say so uh, yeah it's it's fine um but it's just like it it, it was and again at that point i'd already firmly entrenched myself in the primetime world but mm. it very felt like the end of the of the original dream and that felt sad mm. and felt but you know these days it's i mean it's hard to cover the primetime tv shows i cover like it, it is Yes. And I do want to get into that because I do, I do feel like everything you've been talking about, you know, I just maybe flippantly was calling out people who don't do their research when they go to a set. But at the same time, I, sometimes I do think that's unfair when I make those judgments, because I do know you're, uh, if you're a staff writer on at a magazine or on a website, whatever, you don't necessarily have control over what you're writing about. And today you may just get be get pulled into an assignment because it comes up, it's important to your editor and you're stopping what you're doing to do it. And you might not have the institutional knowledge or the time to prepare the institutional knowledge, especially about shows that are- I promise. (laughs) Well, here's the thing. I'm not, I'm not saying this is okay. I'm saying this is what's happened in journalism when people keep getting laid off and people are saying, let's cut the budget and have one person do the job of five. So I want to talk a little bit about something that you are covering today, maybe that is influencing you a lot. Like you tell me what that is, and then I will have questions about it. 
but I'm I'm curious about what you feel is a one of the bigger influences on you in this way, in this coverage perspective. I mean, I think it would be disingenuous to say to point to anything else outside of the Wolf Entertainment Universe because I cover nine scripted Wolf Entertainment shows, which sounds brain breaking enough if you're just looking at it that way. If you start to think about it, a normal season in a non-strike, non-COVID, because there has been a lot of weirdness in the past couple of years, those shows get at least 22 episodes a year. That is 198 hours of episodes worth of television in a single season, which I did the math. That's like five weeks of work just watching those shows. That's not even counting rewatching. That's not counting interviews. It's not counting transcribing interviews or about last night's or anything in that regard. Five weeks of my year is dedicated to these shows within this franchise world. It is insane. It is. And I want to say, I think years ago, one, that's one person's job. One person's job would have been dedicated to covering this and only this, but this is a piece of what you do because you can't just, you're, you're not a Dick Wolf fan site. You're not just covering these nine shows and going about your life. You're covering whatever's popular and on television. So you just mentioned something I thought was really interesting. You said the amount of hours it takes to watch them. It's, it's they're hour long dramas. There's nine a week. If everything is on in a given week, which, you know, sometimes they stagger, but for the majority of time, things are on the same week. Um, you mentioned rewatching, which I am—I I want to clarify for our audience—is probably you're rewatching because you have to do an interview with somebody and you need more, whatever you need more detail or to remember something. You mentioned interview time, and that's not just doing the interview; it's prep, it's transcribing, as you mentioned, it's writing up the interview, it's maybe editing video for the interview. What I want to know is on top of all of that, which is already crazy, and I don't even want to ask you how many hours overall it takes you for one week when you consider in all those things, because I think everybody's brains will break. But I do (laughs) want to know, I do want to (laughs) know how much you had, you felt when you started covering these shows, you had to go back because some of these shows have been on for 20 years. uh, Franchises have been on for 20 years, rather go back and rewatch all of those to have that institutional knowledge I was talking about to know if something came up in episode five of this current season, if it was out of character, for example, because of something that might have happened. Like how deep invested involved do you get in that? And how much does that add to the way you cover things, the way you think about covering things in addition to the time? Sorry, that was a very long winded question. Yeah, it's not a long one. It's it's good and it's important. And um, I will clarify one thing on my end. When I say rewatching, it's not even just prepping for interviews. You know this. Some people who are listening may not. When we get screeners, they're not the final version of the episodes. That's true. And this is across the board for all shows, all networks. Some streamers will give final versions, but even then, it's rare. Um. It is extremely, extremely common to get episodes that are 90% complete. There can be missing missing visual effects. There's missing ADR. ADR is when they're kind of aligned and come out clear. So the actor needs to go in and record it. And that can be done literally with a lot of shows the week it airs. So like we hear someone (laughs) say the line's in the wrong. It's not the actual actor. It's not the right affect. Um... There are a number of shows in general where I have seen different versions of the episodes or I know about different versions of the episodes yes. and what air. But that, and that's so, the thing. You're, I, I, we didn't even say, you, thankfully, with all of the amount of time it takes you to do this, you are watching screeners when you can. You are seeing ahead to be able to plan a little bit for this thing that may come out in a few days, may come up in a few weeks. But when I think about that, it sounds like it saves time, but it doesn't because of all the things that you're saying, because you end up having to, if you get it early, you usually have to watch it a second time for all of these reasons you've just said. 
I am immensely, to be clear, every publicist who gives us a screener, like I'm gonna, yes. if you're- Yes, we want the screeners. We are thrilled with the screeners. Don't stop sending them. And it is such a, bl- this sounds cheesy. It's a blessing. It's a privilege. It is extremely important to let us have that kind of time to kind of even just even plan coverage because something big happens, we want to know about it so we can write to it if we have time, et cetera, et cetera. Especially if we're on the West Coast, mm-hmm. it's not the easiest to watch unless, for instance, the network, there are accommodations made, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's, if you're on the West Coast, it's not like you can just turn on your TV. Like you have to work with people to kind of help you actually get to see the episodes. It's it's a whole thing. Um, but yeah, so like it's there are times where I've written entire stories and then something that was supposed to be in an episode doesn't happen. And I have to frantically edit at the last second and tweak something to be like, okay, this is this. Um, and that and that is the, that's the name, name of the game. So like that happens. This is not a one show thing. This is not a one. Mm-hmm. It's again across all of the shows on all of network TV. It is a long process to make episodes. Yeah. Anyways. That is my thing. Um, so but here's team- what I, oh, okay, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. The actual question. Cause I got us just, again, we get distracted um, to answer your actual question. So I, for a lot of these shows, I was in on the ground floor. Um, I started watching SVU, not in 1999. <laughs> that would have been problematic. Um, but I, started- I mean, some of us are old, Marissa. It was not, I was watching it in 1999 and I wasn't writing about it yet, but you know, it was fine. <laughs> I started watching uh, SVU uh, as a senior in high school um, because a friend, my best high school best friend loved it. And I was like, how could you watch the show? And then I watched it and I was like, oh, now I get how you watch the show. (laughs) Um, And so I've been watching almost entirely on. There was a a short period where I I, um, may have rage quit a little bit, Mm -hmm. but it was fine because it, you know, that's the thing when you're not at, I I mean, but I covered the show or something. I, I which also, by the way, is the strange thing because you're talking about forgetting things. I am generally good at not forgetting things. Yeah. Forgot that I interviewed Andre Brower about SVU until oh. his unfortunate passing because I started getting a lot of traffic from linking to something. I'm like, I didn't interview him. Like, I knew I interviewed him a ton for Brooklyn mm. Nine-Nine, but I had no memories of this. And I looked and went, oh my God, I interviewed him in 2012 for yeah. SVU. Like, oh my God, I completely forgot about this. Like... I felt awful and it was, but it's like, I was covering it, mm-hmm. you know, back in a very different time for journalism. Cause like that was back in the, mm. things were very different in terms of journalism back then. Um, but I, you know, I covered it then. I didn't cover it at all at TV Guide Magazine because the person who covers it at TV Guide Magazine has been covering it since day one. Um, so I had the luxury at some point to briefly rage quit. Um, but watched that since the beginning i did not go i could not go back and rewatch law and order when that because law and order just came back within the past couple of years right the majority of the series is not streaming anywhere and they kept saying it was going to be and so i was waiting for it to all be on peacock so i could watch and it has not materialized so my i will say my um i've done a lot of research obviously um, about Law and Order, and I've and I've done as much as possible, but I have not seen the entirety of it because. Sure. And to be fair, it's it's kind of I was not expecting you to say, "Oh my God, yes, I absolutely went back." Like it's yeah, it's that, almost unrealistic to ask somebody to go back and to do that, especially for a procedural where you know week to week the cases are new, the characters are new. If somebody has come in as a guest star and they've been on the show as a guest star before, like that's easily researchable without having to see who they played before. You're not necessarily having to go that in depth every time, but at the same time, sometimes you want to, or sometimes like if you do have that deeper knowledge, it allows you to pitch different things to write different angles that someone who, you know, I think about all the time, if somebody's coming into journalism today, just at a college, I mean, I worked with interns last year who didn't know, you know, certain shows. They didn't know like what Murphy Brown was. And and so that I, I that's always in my mind because it's a show about journalism. But th- there were other shows that they just had no knowledge of. Also, very similar, not available via streaming. So it's like, I don't even know how to tell you to, to, to educate yourself sometimes. Yeah. Um, all yeah. that to say, this is a lot of work. But yeah, you, well, again, you are the owner and operator of this website. You are choosing to write about 
these nine shows on top of all of the other shows, what made you say it's worth it for me to choose to, to write about all of these shows? I will say to your earlier point quickly, I do think okay. it is important to know things because I, you, yeah. I, I do think with, for instance, I to use a law and order as an example, I think you can go into that a little bit cleaner because the point they've always been clear that the point of that those episodes are supposed to be the cases. Mm-hmm. So, and obviously there was ties in the first season and a little bit beyond with Sam Waterston to a legacy character. And I'd seen enough of Jack McCoy to know who that character was. I knew who that man was, but like the focus in that particular show is supposed to be about the cases on a show on the other eight wolf shows. Mm -hmm. There is a character centric, like it is not a procedural. It should not be a procedural in most cases that is primarily focused on the cases. Like, right. Even the F, like FBI used to be kind of the least personal one. And mm-hmm. that had more personal elements. I've been, again, that's something I've been watching since the beginning. Um, so, and I feel like with something like, for instance, with SVU, where Olivia is a character who has been there since day one of the show, knowing who she was in mm-hmm. season one, knowing who she was in season seven, knowing who she was in season 14, those are important to inform who she is in season 25. And I think... Knowing- Depending on how you're choosing to write about the show. I mean, I think if you are just choosing to focus on the cases, and I think that would not be the smartest way to write about the show. But again, yes. if there's somebody being asked to cover something that they don't know about, that's how they're going to do it. And it's going to be a limited view. Yes. But then if you, but you can't, I, I think to your point, like you're, what you're saying is you can't really do that with like a, the one Chicago shows because yes. all of those shows are so, those character relationships matter so much that you even the simplest thing as an inflection in the way a, an actor delivers a certain line tells you about how they feel about that person. And when they do it differently in the next time that we're, they're with that person, there's been a change in their relationship that you'd miss if you didn't know that nuance. Which to answer that and also to kind of address your next, your question. Sorry, we're all over the place and it's only the first episode. No, it, it's good. Cause like I, you know me, I want to talk all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, is like, so I didn't actually cover, I covered a little bit of fire season one, fire season two and PD season one before I moved to TV Guide magazine. And then I took a okay. several break because again, they were not my shows right. so much to deal with. I could not add, you know, whole franchises on top of it, et cetera, et cetera. But then when I came back to give my remote and was covering these full times, I did catch up on everything that I missed. And that's so essential because like there was a recent thing in a Chicago fire episode that aired earlier this year that, you know, was touching on a relationship that was years old that I had completely forgotten about because it'd been so m- this show was on season right. 12, so many years ago that I was like, but the fans oh. didn't forget about it. I mean, the fans, I don't know if the fans were actively thinking about it in a constant because it had been such a, it was oh, not- no, no. I just mean like when they see it. Yeah. They've like when been they keep- watching the whole time. They're having that moment of probably very similar to you. Like, oh, I can't believe this. They're talking right. about this again. And like that, if you're ser- if you're trying to service that audience in your writing, write about things that they care about. You and need that's- that knowledge to know that they would care about that when you watch that. Because you're not you're not writing about the show in real time necessarily, right? Like you're not you're not. You could live blog episodes, you could live tweet episodes. We all used to do that, but you're not waiting until the next day to read what the fans said to then go ask, hey, who can I talk to? Can I do an interview? You'd be so far behind the eight ball. You would never catch up. It wouldn't be worth it. All of those interviews and who you're talking to for what episode. I don't know if a lot of people even understand how far in advance we we try to set those up for you to know, to have that screener and to know, hey, this is a thing that they mentioned that's from years ago but but if i got a quote about that that would be great for this story that is journalism that is how you do this there are things where it's like when they reference things that you know are important and and having that institutional knowledge to you to your point is vital and honestly i think having that expertise for lack of a better word or that 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 history in my head because it all lives in my head it is both so it makes things exciting when I choose to cover things in an unusual way but also makes it so yeah when there are moments that land that would not land for a casual viewer or a new viewer it's like oh this means something to me this is something that I care um and so 
you know, how I came to cover all of these, honestly, it is a mixture of some of it is good publicists. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, it, this sounds silly, but having good publicists who work with you, who help facilitate interviews, who help with screeners, that is a god like again as cheesy as it sounds that's a godsend because it's it like it doesn't sound cheesy i mean like you can't you can't do they can't do your job their job without you and to a degree you can't do part of your job without them if you if they won't say yes to an interview you're limited in how you can write about the show you can still write your review you can still just do you know here's what's coming up here are the photos here are the trailers but it's not as extensive as maybe you want to cover right and it's it's something where there are nine shows. There are five different publicity teams spread out between the nine shows, but there's overlap with mm -hmm. a number, um, of different publicists, et cetera. And there are some people who I talk to multiple times a week because it's just worth, so, there's so many things that we're setting up, whether it's current or upcoming or, or like looking ahead, you know, a month. There's so many things going on. And it's just having people who are responsive, people who are, people who care about getting coverage, people who, again, it just, who are able to make things accessible, who, and it's, it is, it helps because there are so many shows. Like we are in a post peak TV era. We've discussed it's a post. Have we it's decided a, that we are in a post peak? I, so many people still so say peak we're TV. We're starting to a little bit, but I again, mean, we are literally starting to slide because of things like COVID and things like the strikes have have slowed down how many are coming yeah. out every year. But I'm not entirely convinced that like when we catch up from the strike that we won't still have a high, high number and people won't oh, still be saying peak TV. It's going to be over 400 shows. Like it's going to be insane. But it's like there are shows outside of this franchise that I love dearly mm. that are to cover. There are shows outside of this franchise that if I did not love the way that I loved them, mm -hmm. I would stop covering them entirely because it is so difficult to cover them. And I'm not talking about like the stranger things, like the big shows. I'm talking about like smaller shows that have no reason to be as difficult as they are because. Well, because I mean, sometimes when it's a smaller show, they're just not putting any resources or effort behind it because it, and it's, it is that unfortunate notion of if you'd put a little more effort or resources behind it, more people would see it and then it maybe wouldn't be a small show. But it's that whole like the way that journalism has turned into we can only cover the top trending shows because then we know we're going to get traffic. It's that we can only put our money behind the things that we know are huge and splashy and have big names attached. And uh, we could do a whole podcast on that those politics. I <laughs> have so many thoughts and feelings that I don't even know if I'm allowed to talk about. But I mean, I am. Like, I work for myself now, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of it's certainly helpful if somebody is helping you cover the show, but at the same time, I, as a lay person currently, like I'm not doing journalism right now, but, and I'm looking at you saying nine, nine shows, yeah, so nine hours, and all of these extra hours, like, is it, is, do you feel like your love for these shows or these people who work on them? Is that a, the driving factor? Yes. I mean, it's look, I would not be able to cover the shows that I cover without elements of love. Like I, I'm unapologetically a lover of television. Like again, if you've spent five minutes with me, probably literally in any capacity, like I love TV. Like I am a dork. I'm a nerd. Like I love the escapism. I love, this is a fictional reality. Like this is not this is not a hyper real, like this is a world in which things could be better. Like I, we are living in a world where, you know, these shows portray first responders in a heroic light. It is mm -hmm. the world that we wish things could be because as someone who I've had encounters where I needed the police to help me and they didn't I've had encounters right. where EMTs to help me and they didn't you know it is not saying this is the world we live in it is a nice world it is a again and it's not saying it is as sci-fi as fringe or person of interest or any it's it is like a person of interest in a way because person of interest was grounded but it was also not the real world it is very right. much 
kind of vain to me. And that's, um, I think that's what's also a very interesting piece of this that we're not really touching on because I think it is also another conversation is so many years of law and order were cop agenda and what has that done for us? And I think looking at it the way that you're talking about it is like, we're not saying this is the real world. We're saying this is what it should be is an interesting way to look at it. Although I will say, speaking specifically about SVU, because I that was the one that I also watched the most. I'm just going to say it. Internet's going to yell at me. Elliot should have been fired because he did a lot of things that I remember. I, mean, I don't remember every single episode, but I do remember we're we're making him be the hero because he's doing anything that it takes to get the guy to get the answer. But a lot of the tactics were not good tactics and were things that we are saying now the world collectively, hopefully the world collectively is agreeing are detrimental, especially when you talk about false confessions and racial profiling. And again, that's maybe not really the conversation we're having today. I think, especially in the time we have left in this podcast is too much to really dive into, but I think it's a very interesting point in terms of how you cover these shows and being able to say, I'm acknowledging this isn't the real world to me is a very smart way to look at it. But I will also say to your point, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I do think there has been a false. He has in some ways been made the false face of this. And I'm not saying again, I'm not excusing what was done back then. Okay. So maybe watches an embarrassing amount of SVU reruns outside of Munch, every single one of those characters should have been fired. That's fair. Like, and I just, and that's why I was saying, I don't remember everything. There yeah. are just certain things that stick out in my mind. And and, and to be totally fair to the show at the original time that I watched it, if you know that that's the bad guy, you're on his side. You want him to do whatever it takes to get the bad guy because it's a very black and white world of, we know that's the bad guy, right? right. But that's not how the real world works. Right. And that's the thing. It's like, there were literal plot lines about that, about, about how his mm -hmm. desire you want to take down people was bad and you know and and in terms of like you know his thoughts about hurting people who had hurt people was bad right. like literally a thing within the show but i think right. there i think again i'm not excusing mm -hmm. that particular behavior but i think it is equally complicated to pretend that the other characters did not cross the line oh absolutely in ways and in ways, again, it's outside of Munch, yeah. and I that might literally be the only one in the duration of the series. Mm. Every other character, you know, was violent in a way that they shouldn't have been, were inappropriate in public. Like, again, right. they all didn't think he did, but because that was kind of, he was the lead, and that was a situation where he, where that, you know, that was the thing, like, like they've talked about like she is a nurturer he is the protector and the, right. it's kind it's of the yeah they built it that way and, right and, but it's at the same time it is it has been frustrating for me as a reporter to see people be like well he's awful 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 it's like i'm not excusing what oh, right. and what he's done in general but yeah, i think and i do want to say that i wasn't saying it he's awful yeah. awful awful either i'm also acknowledging like they wrote it in a time where they weren't having these conversations they should have been but they weren't having the nuanced discussion of like what can our cop do because he's representing cops and and are people going to think that this is okay behavior and things like that and not just again you're right not just him yeah. but in general the way that we write cops on tv that's the thing where it's just it's been frustrating to see people be like well he's awful and, and violence okay well why is when he does this bad but mm. when another character is doing the exact same thing or worse that's not bad like again love olivia benson she attacked a suspect right. who was handed to the table and kicked the crap and beat them like that's not something that's no, that's not okay either i did not see that episode but i've heard about this so it's so... just like there are a lot of things where like again it's not it's different thing because his anger was more of in the forefront of the storytelling mm -hmm. it's something where I think it's also harmful to talking about how these stories were told in general. If yeah. you only say, well, he's the only problem. Everything else was perfect. No, the way the storytelling as a whole back then was an issue. And again, it's not saying it's perfect now. There are episodes. I'm the, yeah. <laughs> it, 
No, but like that's the thing, and it's and it's and that is to my point something that I feel extremely strongly about. I am not going to lie if an episode or if a storyline makes me uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think it is. So I I don't think that you should be asked to lie. I mean, you're a journalist. You're not an extension of publicity. I think the problem is that a lot of times when, when there's a coverage of a show that is like I was talking about before, they're asking the questions that will service the fans that I think that's, there's a line like you want to ask the questions that will service the fans because that will get you traffic. And that shows that like, you know, the show and you're doing a good job, but you can't shy away from asking the hard questions or you're a fan site. You're not a professional journalist. And I think that that is something that gets muddier and muddier every day, not just fans. I don't mean to say fan site in a negative way. I just mean in the sense of sometimes there are outlets, there are people that will ignore the bigger questions because they don't want to get on the bad side of the publicist or there's a million reasons, but they're not asking those questions. And so that is skewing the coverage. And to me, that is doing a disservice for everybody, including the show itself, because they should be able to acknowledge what they're doing and what they're putting into the world. Yeah. I mean, for me, it is something where my mandate has always been, if I am honest, when I don't like something or something isn't working for me, you can believe when I say I love something. Like if I'm that's saying- That's true I'm, too. Yeah, you need to be an authority at a trustworthy, again, that's journalism. We need to be able to trust you. I, I and there are people who who only want to hear if something is good. And, and mm-hmm. let's be clear, I don't want to dislike any of my shows. In a perfect world, if every episode was fantastic, great, fantastic, <laughs> I'd be happy. But that's just, there's this not- a, Oh, go ahead. Live, that's ever and, been- that has ever existed that is a perfect show because making TV by itself is a miracle because there are a hundred things that can go wrong in every single production day, whether it's an actor gets sick, you lose the location, yeah. a, a line isn't coming out the way they want it to, you know, X, Y, or Z. Now, now, certainly with COVID and with the strikes, there's so many things that go wrong. It is a miracle every single time an episode makes its air because there are so many things that could go wrong that we know about or we don't know about that Mm. at any given point but like my thing has always been yeah it's like if I'm saying that I love this I mean that I'm not gonna lie because I don't feel like that does because again if I'm saying everything is incredible why would you ever trust me about anything ever well I don't think it's only just if you're saying everything is incredible I think it's also if you're only choosing to cover the shows that you genuinely find zero fault with. Now, I don't know if there is anybody out there that finds zero fault with anything, but I also feel, and please tell me how you feel about this. If you genuinely love something and you find zero faults with every episode, it's harder to write about sometimes. I think it's harder, and maybe this is because I'm a cynical person, I think it's harder to find new ways to say something is good especially if it's something I'm asked to cover week to week in that editorial opinion review perspective, then I think it is to be able to say, I see something here that I want to pick apart a little bit. I want to talk about like, it made me think, it made me question, it made me wonder if they could have done this differently or better. I think if all I have to say is like, that was real fun. I loved it. I struggle to know what to say, which is honestly why I think sometimes it's harder to write about comedies because sometimes it is just like this thing was fun this thing made me smile and laugh for half an hour the end yeah so I I agree with that I do think I find it harder to write about okay episodes than good or bad like for me if something is just fine and passable I'm like what do I say like it's not offensively Mm. bad I don't want to start tearing it apart but if it's not read I don't want to be like oh my god this was so good like so I try to so uh, what I do if people don't know uh, I do a column every basically every weekday uh, called about last night um which was originally intended to be micro opinions which if anyone has read them it's probably laughing their face off right now so it was intended to be basically like a tweet length reaction to an episode at the time it was 140 characters I was like gonna be like one sentence two sentences that my reaction hard I do not follow that even remotely, um, which is to my own uh, detriment, to be clear. Um, but it is something, you know, to use an easy example, uh, 
Ghosts is a show that I love dearly. I don't think that's a, a secret or a surprise. Um, there was a recent episode where I was like, it's fine. Like it's, and that's not normally I have a reaction I have to the show, but I'm like, I don't really know what to say about this episode. So like mm. it was a couple sentences. I moved on. Like if I love something, I can normally, even if I don't, I can only pick out a thing or two and kind of make it um, the focus. So like I could say, oh, I love this subplot. This is why this worked for me, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, if something is, and to talk to the procedurals, like covering 190, like, the thing about covering all nine of these shows is for what it's, uh, one thing I've been told is that I'm one of two people who covers all nine of them, which is. says a lot about how hard it is. It says, says a lot and it's, but I also think by covering all nine of them, I can see larger patterns. Mm -hmm. I can see when certain shows are repeating the same. Because also just if you're watching, it's not, they're not all cop shows, but like if you're right. seeing a bunch of like cop like shows taking the same thing, as long as you see all these different things that you can kind of give context. You're saying if someone says you can't do this on the show, it's like you absolutely can. They're doing it on three other shows right there. Don't tell me this can't be done in the same world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, if you're just speaking to the crime, mm -hmm. it is a difficult thing to write about week mm -hmm. to week, especially with something, again, like SVU. It is a sensitive topic. There are, I cannot say that there are more survivors watching this show than other shows, mm -hmm. but specifically, this is a show where more survivors are open about being sexual assault survivors and sexual, you know, abuse survivors than other shows. Um, and I think that is something that a lot of women have gone through and a lot yeah. of women can kind of uh it certainly changes the way that i cover the show in terms of like i'm not going to make light of any of this stuff it is not i know things that have personally bothered me mm -hmm. even if they have people as much as other things i know of things that have bothered a lot of the fans that mm -hmm. have not bothered me in the same way everyone has different triggers everyone has different things yeah that bother them and and that and that and so i never want to be light or glib or anything about those particular cases if it is a boring episode if i can write two sentences and be out that's the dream it's very rare that i can get that because there's always something i feel like i can say um but it, yeah if you're just talking about the cases it is difficult to kind of find things which is why i, t I tend to write about the personal stuff a little bit more um, and I do think that's what the, you know, the fans that have been around for all these years that they want to, you know, they, again, just to circle back to what we've been talking about, they want to know that they're coming to you for a certain type of coverage because they, they know, you know, the show the way that they know the show, right? You know, and they just want to know what happened in the case that week. They could read the summary on any website. Right. And I will say, um, so to your point about, you know, it is so, uh, I mentioned this to you and I, and I have not been really shy about this. I think organized crime is incredible this season. Like it is, I, it is the best, sh I mean, I'd say certainly network show on TV this year and it's not even close. And I guess it has the privilege of being. I just want to say that it, we, this is March and she's throwing down this gauntlet already. And there's still a lot of shows to premiere. So just everybody remember this. But I'm just saying, first of all, yes, it is six up. It's halfway through its season at this point because we're mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. season. But also, it's halfway through its season, which means it has a lot more opportunities to have messed up a lot of things, and it has <laughs> not. It is, it is, like it is stunning. Okay, this I was like, I knew this was going to be the point where like you started laughing at me because I love things in a like extreme way, and you it's have, not. I'm not laughing in a bad way. I'm just laughing at that you threw down the gauntlet that this is the best show uh, and we haven't seen so much of what's going to happen this season yet in tv in general if someone thing else wants to surprise me bring it on but mm. so far through six episodes this is it's not even close like it is and i it is good on, on a level that isn't that goes beyond procedural and i and to your earlier point organized crime is one of the only procedurals that is actually and actively handled Mm -hmm. police conversation like it was built into its dna of the show Which not I only think was very like, smart right not only with the elliot of it all but like their lead is a black woman mm -hmm. who's a queer character like this is it is they dealt with 
the racism and the four and this the police brutality and they've dealt with things from the very start um but this season it's an entirely new team on the writing side and, and directing side well, mostly the directing side it is good in a way that inspires me to write in a way that would make you laugh no <laughs> this is why we're doing this yeah. podcast this is these like, are this is why you're picking yeah. these things yeah. to be what's influencing you now yeah. this is the point like we i want to talk about stuff well i want you guys to come on and talk about stuff that you are feeling energized by inspired by etc so like i mean we spent a lot of time in this conversation talking about how much work it is to do this, yeah. but to hear that it's not just work, it's worth it is, that's the whole point. It's very hard to cover a show you don't love. It's very hard to cover a show you've fallen out of love with, even mm. if it was in the past, and then you have to kind of find, to work a way to find your way back there, hopefully. Um, with this show, there was, I mean, it's been incredible the entire season, but like, a recent episode, I watched the ep episode ahead of time, um, and I watched it kind of knowing what I was going going to get going into it, because I knew enough about that episode and what was happening, but I knew some things. And I finished the episode, and I was so, like, it changed my entire, like, it was good, but it was a gut punch. Like, it was- What a, episode? Uh- I didn't know if you wanted me to be specific. <laughs> um, uh, let me. I, it's the one I told you to watch. Um, let me get make sure I say the exact. Like title. I'm gonna remember the title of what you told me to watch. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> it's it okay if you don't actually remember. I just I for everybody at home, maybe we can. No, uh, put I mean, it in my brain post. is like thinking like four episodes ahead. I don't want to say the wrong because these episodes keep changing titles too. So I want to make sure I have the right one. Um, that I'm telling you, because like right now I want to make sure I say the exact one correct. Wait, while Marissa looks up this episode title, I just want to say as we are running out of time on the podcast, if you've been inspired as Marissa and I have by all of this TV, and I, I do want to tell you where you can go ahead and watch this. Um, I do need to say none of this podcast is sponsored by or getting any perks from the services I'm about to mention. Um, we, I'm just sharing it so that you guys can fall in love as well. Unfortunately, One Life to Live is not streaming and it is no longer on. But I mentioned Days of Our Lives. If you want to get a little taste of the soap world, that's on Peacock. Um, the Law and Order and Chicago Universe shows are on Peacock as well. Although, as Marissa mentioned, not every season of every show. It's politics and things. And then the FBI Universe, um, which is also one uh, from Dick Wolf, is on Paramount+. Plus. Why is you shaking your head at me? It's not on Paramount correct. Plus anymore. It was when I pulled this statistic. So that's so, the other note I should make is that everything I am saying to you about where things are streaming is as of the time of this recording, which maybe now is not even true. I, I apologize. I literally found it on, on Paramount Plus, I guess, too early before I started recording this podcast. Anyway, did you find your episode? Yeah, it is, It's Missing Persons. I want to make sure those exact titles. Missing Persons, which is on okay. I will say to your ca the caveat, the library seasons of FBI Most Wanted and FBI International are also on Peacock. But oh, okay. Of FBI is on Paramount Plus. The most recent seasons of those three shows are also on Paramount Plus. It is a it is a whole situation. I cannot tell you, but yes, no. So with that episode, I knew some of it was coming. I knew, and I still I finished the episode in like my entire being was changed like it sounds cheesy but like sometimes you watch an episode and it entirely shifts the way that you're feeling like your entire mood like I normally when I watch something I start writing about last night as soon as possible just to kind of at least have something down I could not write it like I was just so mm. like I need to sit with this like it, it was so heartbreaking but so well done that I just like felt like I had been gutted from the inside it was an and that's the thing. It's like there can be deeply sad shows. There can be deeply upsetting shows. Um, there can be, but if they're done well, it like it, and it feels like everything about organized crime this season, the writing, the directing, the acting is, and they've gotten a lot of fantastic guest stars. It's, just, it's been, and the cast, I mean, again, Chris Maloney, I think is one of the most underrated actors on TV. And he's someone who 
you know, back in the days when Emmys were given out to network TV stars should have actually gotten an Emmy back in those days. But he's doing incredible work and it's just something like that makes me excited to live within this world. You know, you know, when you're talking about history, like again, having what makes me excited to do this is the history that I know. Like I did a piece a couple months back um, on an SVU episode that aired 15 years ago mm. because it was an episode that I loved fiercely, that I loved fiercely. And I, there was no information really out there about that. There weren't any interviews because like it wasn't, there was still online journalism, but it wasn't the way online journalism is now. Like right. in a current world, there probably would have been showrunner or probably not writer because they don't let writers talk a lot, but they probably would have at least been showrunner interviews and like EPK stuff. Like there would have been a lot of stuff at that time and there was really nothing about it. And so I was able to speak to the writer. I was able to speak to a longtime recurring actress on the show. And I was able to do a deep dive into an hour that meant a lot to me. Yeah. It also meant a lot to the franchise, meant a lot to the fans. And like doing stuff like that excites me. Like being able to, like, and that's the thing when you're covering 198 episodes a year in a normal season, you have to find ways to cover things beyond what's happening in next week's episode. That's because that's very true, especially if it's a show that does well for you and then goes on hiatus for a little while. You want to fill that gap and you want to keep those people coming back. Right. And it's something where it's like there's rarely a time when I'm not figuring out something for one of these shows. Mm. Like, I, you know, I'm doing a long term project for one of them. I've got a couple of highly, highly, highly ambitious pie in the sky ideas for a couple other things that is unlike anything I've ever done before, wow. um, which excites me. Again, I've been doing this for 75 billion years. Like, you I mean, have not. you're younger I've, than me, but I've been doing but, this a, little, a literal teenager. Like, that's yes, the thing. I was going to say, I mean, it is the bulk of your life. And the fact that I think the fact that you are still so excited about doing it and able to do it this way is amazing. And I feel so terrible for taking, have taken up so much of your time after listening to how long it takes you to do all of these things. Um, so I do want to say thank you for coming on. And I'm so glad you were my first guest on Made Possible by Pop Culture. Maybe you'll come back and maybe we can talk about something a little less stressful sounding because I do want people to know that although Marissa loves it, it's a job, man. And so if you felt a little stressed out by this episode, not every episode may be this stressful. <laughs> Did I stress people out? This is it depressing. stressed me out a little bit, but I also, because I've done this job for so long, it was just giving me a little bit of flashbacks, you know, and that's all, that's all it was. Um, but thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. I'm glad we got to the binarity and we didn't, you know, <laughs> we're going to talk for another four hours. <laughs>